Beach. Good evening. All right, it's good to see you here today, and I uh, hope you've had a good week. Here we are at Wednesday already. Boy, it seems like the, the weeks go by so quickly. Shannon and I were pulling up uh, to the church this evening and noticed on the sign at the mall that it's tax-free weekend coming up, and like, my goodness, seems like we were just talking about Christmas, and here we are with the return of school right upon us. So anyway, time just marches on, and gets a little faster it seems like every year that uh, that goes by but I uh, hope you've had a good week glad that you're here uh, today good to have our guests that are with us and uh, I guess after a couple of time you're not a guest anymore so just make yourself at home all right uh, glad that you're glad that you're here with us all right well we have um, uh, an opportunity to uh, get into some of the most absolutely uh, amazing scripture that is in all of the Bible. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, that's not to discount anything else in the Scripture, but uh, if we can't uh, uncover the truths that are here and walk away with a uh, sense of wonder and awe and, and humility and worship, I don't know that there's a Scripture that I could share with you that would, would provide that for you. Uh, this is absolutely an amazing scripture, and so I look forward to being able to begin the process of uh, sharing it with you tonight. And if you have your Bibles, you can join me in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to begin uh, in verse 15, and we'll read through verse 20. Uh, this is that section of, uh, of scripture that we're going to uh, begin to introduce tonight. I want to thank uh, Robert for helping out last week. Uh, Shannon and I made our way over to Dallas and back all in one day. And so I uh, appreciate him uh, covering for us, listened to uh, his lesson, did a good job, and uh, appreciate you doing that for us, all right? All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll get started. Father, we thank you for uh, this passage that we're going to uh, introduce uh, tonight. Uh, there is so much that's here, and uh, it is wonderful. And I just pray that uh, you would... You would open the eyes of our understanding, that you would give us not only knowledge, but you would give us wisdom and spiritual understanding. Uh, this is such, these truths are so important, and um, not only for followers of Christ in the first century, but for us today, 2022. And I just pray that we would really, really take this seriously. And that we would not just uh, walk away from what we're able to cover tonight, but that we'd make a commitment for the next week to really pray and to ask you to give us understanding. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, here we are in the letter to the uh, Colossians, and uh, I want to read our uh, section that we're going to uh, to talk about tonight. Let me remind you that Many church historians and theologians believe that chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 was either a poem or a hymn in the first century. Some people believe that maybe Paul actually took this uh, poem, if you will, or the lyrics of this hymn and incor incorporated it by the, uh, you know, the, the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit and to place it within Scripture. Uh, whether or not it was a poem or its lyrics to a hymn uh, isn't nearly as important as the fact that we know that it's the inspired word of God, right? It is the inspired word of God, and, and we have so much to learn from this section of Scripture. Uh, I also, as by way of introduction, want to remind you that the letter to the Colossians is really to correct uh, a lot of heresies that are beginning to brew in the first century about, first of all, who Jesus was, his nature, who he really, really was, that would be the Gnostics and mysticism who were redefining who Jesus was. By the way, you, you come out of Gnosticism uh, a little bit later into church history and you have another heretic by the name of Arius uh, who did not believe that Jesus was God. Uh, the mystics, uh, the Gnostic mystics believed that he was a created God by the God uh, but he was a minor god, not, not, not the big god, but kind of a minor god. Uh, Arius took it even further and basically says he's not god at all. Uh, and then you have other religious uh, groups of people who exist in our own community uh, today. They're generally people who ride bikes or knock on your door on Saturday morning that 
tend to not believe that Jesus is God. Uh, they may believe he's a God or they may believe that he's a representative of God, but they don't give him the worship that he deserves as God. And so when we're looking at this, I mean, this is a problem in our culture as well, uh, where people don't have the proper reverence for who Christ is, his person. And, and I'll just say this, if you don't get his person right, you're probably not going to get his work right, Okay. And so both of those are really, really big issues. Now, for those of us who I would say are, who are Orthodox Christians in the sense that, you know, we're, we're fundamental in our beliefs about certain things, we may give verbal um, adherence to certain doctrinal truths, but we need to go beyond that. We need to have a real sense of wonder and awe when it comes to the truths that are here, th this is absolutely incredible. Uh, as I've said to you before, uh, as you ponder these things, I mean, take a moment as we read this together, what if these things are true? <laughs> and of course they are, but I challenge you, I mean, what, what if these things are reality? Then I, I think it changes the way that we live our lives, and it changes the way that we go about our daily lives, and and I think that's the purpose of it uh, as much as anything else. So, beginning in verse fifteen, uh, Colossians chapter one, verse fifteen, Paul writes. He says, speaking of Jesus, he says, "He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him." All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things in earth or things in heaven or on earth and things in heaven, having made peace through the blood uh, of his cross." Wow, what, what, a, what an unbelievable passage that, that, that is. If you'll go over uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, before we begin to knock on the door of this particular passage, I, I think there's a couple of things we need to remind ourselves of. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, Jesus uh, is... Uh, with his disciples uh, on the night that he's going to be betrayed. He's doing a lot of teaching. Um, John chapter 13 through chapter 17 is, is actually one section of Scripture, and all of these occur on the night uh, that Jesus is betrayed, and he, he's really pouring into them because he's, he's running out of time, and he's really trying to prepare them. Uh, with a sense of urgency. But one of the things that Jesus says, and it's a beautiful thing, he, he does tell them, and it creates some concern for them, he tells them that he's leaving and they can't come. All right? And he says, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send a, a helper to come. And uh, he, he calls him uh, the comforter or the helper. Uh, in, the, uh, in the original language, in the Greek, it's parakletos, one who comes alongside of, uh, to whisper in your ear, to give you direction or encouragement or, or instruction. And he says that I have to leave or he can't come. Okay, and then in the context here of chapter 16, he tells us some of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not everything, but he tells us something extremely, extremely significant. And in chapter 16, beginning in verse 12, Jesus says, I, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, first of all, why could they not bear them? Well, they couldn't understand it, for one thing, because this was going to be something that they had not ever experienced before. Uh, one of the other things is because they're distracted. Because in John chapter 14, Jesus has said, you know, I'm leaving and you can't follow. 
That's a problem. Uh, because they've given up everything to follow him. Okay, now he's leaving and, and they're not following. Uh, or they can't follow. Uh, second of all, uh, one of them is going to betray him. So you've got, you got a fox in the hen house. Okay, and so they're, they're concerned about that. And then uh, one of the ones who is apparently the strongest says, uh, I, I'd die or I'd go to jail for you. And Jesus says, no, before the night's over, you'll deny that you even know me three times. Now, it, their world's upside down. Their world is upside down. And so honestly, I think a lot of probably what Jesus said in these chapters right here probably came across to them like uh, the teacher in Charlie Brown cartoons. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because they're distracted, man. They, they, their hearts are heavy. I mean, they, they, and they don't even know how much the world's going to turn upside down for the next three days, right? And so there's a lot that's going on here. But Jesus says, there's a lot of things I want to share with you, but you can't bear them right now. However, verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. No, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this. If the Holy Spirit is not speaking by his own authority, he's only speaking what he is hearing, who's he hearing it from? The Father. Right? The Father. So that's an important thing for us to consider, and we don't have time to develop that tonight. But as the Spirit of God uh, speaks to us, and as we get into the Word of God and the Spirit of God speaks to us, you have to understand it's your Father that's speaking. Your Father that's speaking. And he says, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me. That's real important. If you're taking notes, write that down. And if you take notes in your Bible, write that down. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is not so much about exposing who he is. It's about exposing who Jesus is. Now, the gifts that we receive from God and include the person and the gifts of the Holy Spirit all come through Jesus Christ. When, when I have shared over and over with us in our study of Colossians that if you have Jesus, you have everything you need, that includes the Holy Spirit. Okay, that includes the Holy Spirit because part of the gifting that comes to us is the fact that God in the person of the Holy Spirit now comes to live within us. Now, that's a radical thing. We're blessed. Abraham didn't have the Holy Spirit. Noah didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, they, they may have had the Holy Spirit maybe communicate things to them in, in, in a variety of ways, or maybe like David, the anointing that he had on his rule of, of being a king. You know, the Holy Spirit would come upon people and, and would anoint them for ministry and task and things of that nature. But the indwelling presence of God is very particular to our dispensation. We have God living within us. And that's, that's a blessing. And so when I say we have Jesus, we have everything we need, don't think that discounts the Holy Spirit. No, he is a gift to us and everything that's associated with that. But the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he's going to glorify the Son. And by the way, the purpose of the Son is not even to glorify himself, it's to glorify the Father. Right? So as the Spirit glorifies Christ and as Christ glorifies uh, or, or his, as he's glorified, then his life, his person, his ministry, his work, both then and now are glorifying the Father. And so he says he'll tell you these things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. So again, what's the source of every good thing we have? James chapter 1, the Father, the Father. James chapter 1 says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, right? You, you've got a good Father. I don't know what your earthly father was like, but I know you have a good Father in heaven, and he does not withhold anything good for you, right? Right? 
And he does that because it's been purchased by his son. And the agency by which we receive those things is the agency of the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, th- I didn't even want to get into all that. That's just good preaching. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, unto, or I said that he will take of mine and will declare it unto you. Now, I mention that because you don't see a lot about the person or the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this letter to the Colossians. If you take a companion letter, which would be the letter of Ephesians, there's a lot of talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The difference is is that the church of Ephesus was much more established in doctrine than the church at Colossae. Remember, Paul's writing because he's had a visit from their pastor. And who was that? Epaphras has come to visit him and said, we got some real issues here. Mysticism, Judaism, asceticism, all these things are attacking us, and there's a lot of confusion about who Jesus is. And so Paul in this letter doesn't really emphasize a lot about the Holy Spirit because he's trying to correct some faulty error or faulty thinking about who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit's behind the scenes doing it because he's, he's, the, he's the one who brings truth. But he's not on the front page here. Jesus is on the front page. And and so as we go through this letter, we're going to see that. And as we go into this passage, we're going to see it. Now, as we as we try to set the context of verses 15 through 20, I want to run quickly back through what uh, Robert taught last week and start reading in verse 9 because it's important to get the context of this to see what Paul's doing as he emphasizes the person and the work of Christ. He says in verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. What's Paul praying for? He tells us. He said, this is what I'm praying for you. He said, I'm asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul says, "My, my biggest concern for you since Epaphras has visited is I want you to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding of his will. Whose will? The Father's will. The Father has a will. And I really want to make this, I really want to emphasize this tonight. The Father does not have a will outside of his Son. Jesus is central to the will of God. It has always been that way. From the fall of Adam in the garden until the consummation of ages in the kingdom to come throughout the day in which we live, God has no will apart from Jesus. So the more we know about Jesus, who he is, what his work has been, what his work will be, the more we have an understanding of the will of God. And people are praying all the time, well, I want to know what God's will is for my life. You'll never find God's will for your life until you understand what God is doing through the Son. You have to do that. And he says, we're praying that you will be filled with knowledge, with wisdom, with spiritual understanding. Why? Verse 10, in order that... Why does God want me filled with knowledge? So I can win a game of Bible trivia? So I can be the smartest guy in church? So I can be the preacher? No. It's not, the the end game is not knowledge. The, the, The knowledge must be granted to us and then associated with that, and this is what the Spirit of God brings, is wisdom. Do you realize that the book of Proverbs says, above all else, pray for wisdom? It doesn't tell you to pray for faith. It doesn't tell you to pray for love. It doesn't tell you to pray for hope. It tells you to what? Ask for wisdom above all else. Not that we don't need love. Not that we don't need faith. Not that we don't need hope. But above all else, in this world, we need wisdom. But you can't have wisdom apart from knowledge. Knowledge is the information. Wisdom is the application of that information. How do I know that? Because he says this in verse 10. He says, I'm praying that you'll be filled with knowledge of his will, all wisdom and spiritual understanding, verse 10, in order that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. The Wednesday night Bible study isn't so you're smarter. The Wednesday night Bible study, the the proclamation of the word of God on Sunday morning or, or Sunday night or a Wednesday night or anytime you're hearing the word of God being presented, it's not so that you're a smarter Christian. It's so that you can what? Surrender yourself to the will of God so that you're pleasing to him. 
We want to walk what? Worthy of the calling that we have received. Paul writes that specifically in the book of Ephesians. He says that in chapter 4. He says that we would walk worthy of our calling. Worthy of our calling. Now, that's going to be very important, too, as you go into the letter to the Colossians and, and as we come out of this section of Scripture in verses 15 through 20, because of the reality of these things in verses 15 through 20, it ought to change the way we live every day. Because you're going you're gonna to have all this theology for pretty much three chapters, maybe two and a half chapters, and then Paul shifts gears. Because you have what? Knowledge and wisdom and spiritual understanding, here's the kind of wife you ought to be. Here's the kind of husband you ought to be. Here's the kind of slave you ought to be. Here's the kind of a, a, a slave owner you need to be. This is how you, as a child, needs to act. If you're an adolescent, this is how you act. That's powerful. It'll change the way you live. And as a result, the way you live is in contradiction to the world around you. That's going to bring two things. It's going to bring an opportunity to do what? Keep reading here. That you may walk worthy of the, uh, of the Lord, verse 10, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. So what's it do? Whenever I understand these things, I have knowledge and wisdom and apply it with spiritual understanding, it changes how I act as a husband. It changes how I act as a father. It changes how I behave as a grandfather. And the people around me, what? Recognize that. Especially in the Roman Empire when the father was the patriarch of the home and he could do anything he wanted to his wife. She had no legal rights. He could do anything he wanted to his children. They had no legal rights. If he wanted to abuse them, if he wanted to not feed them, if he didn't want to come home, if he wanted to abandon them, nobody in the Roman Empire thought anything about it. Don't think that's 2,000 years ago. Look at the homes in America today. And let me encourage you, because some of you are like me. You're on a second marriage. Okay? If you're in a second marriage, behave the way you ought to behave. You can't do anything about where you've been. You only do about where you are and where you're headed. The reason I say that is because I know how Satan works in condemnation. Because as soon as I say it, you're going to look back and you're going to think about the, the mess you've made in the past. We're not talking about the mess in the past. We're talking about where we are today. Yeah, and where we're going. Okay, and, and, and so he says here, you're going to be fruitful, and, and not only that, you're going to have a chance to have a testimony before unbelievers. And remember, there's a letter that goes with Colossians. It's a letter to Philemon, and what did Paul tell uh, Philemon to do about a runaway slave who stole from him? Accept him back like a brother, basically set him free. Because if he's your brother, you don't own him. Paul didn't have to say we need to picket slavery in the Roman Empire. His expectation was that when you come to Christ, you're going to be a different person. Not that we shouldn't have legislation. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have legislation. Thank God that there's been the breakdown of some of those things uh, in our culture and in British culture and that we know that it's evil to, to, to have people in slavery. Thank God that for that, right? But it all begins with what? The transformation of the heart. I mean, one of the most beautiful hymns we sing is Amazing Grace. Do you know John Newton? What, what was John Newton before he came to Christ? Slave trader. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was a slave trader. I sold human beings for a living. Wow. That's transformational power. That changes things. And he says here, he said, we pray for you that you'll have this, that you're producing fruit. And then in verse 12, he says, Thank, giving thanks to the Father. There should never, ever be a day in our lives that we don't pause somewhere along the way at least 10, 15, 20, 25, 1,000 times a day and just thank God that he's our Father. 
I don't care if you don't have money to put in the gas tank. I don't care if you can't buy your favorite ding-dongs at the grocery store because they're too expensive. It don't matter. You have a Father in heaven, and we ought to be grateful. If for nothing else, we ought to get up every day with joy that the God of the universe calls me his own and that I can call out to him any time and, and cry, Abba, Father. Daddy, what a deal. And then he says here, he says, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Wow. Isn't that good news? I mean, how, how bad it would it be if we read this? Giving thanks to the Father uh, who has accepted us because we've qualified ourselves. Well, number one, if I've qualified myself, thanks goes to me. Why am I going to thank the Father if I've qualified myself? And you're going to question the qualification. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you should. And you should. But he does. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has what? Qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, that's not the first time you're going to see light in this passage. Robert brought this up last week. Keep going. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of. We were born in darkness. We were under the authority and the power of darkness. We were by nature, Paul says in Ephesians. We were by nature children of disobedience, the children of wrath. That's who we were to the core. And we were, we were at the mercy of, of darkness, right? But what does he say in verse 13? He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And one of the points I want to make right here, and, and if you're taking notes, write this down. The, the tense that he uses here, he has delivered us, is an aorist tense. What's that mean? It's done. The closest that we have in our English language is past tense. It's done. In other words, don't read it like this, that God is delivering us from the power of darkness. You are already delivered from the power of darkness. Whatever weakness you have, whatever addiction you have, whatever bondage you think you're in, that's already been broken. What you have to do is what? You have to know it, believe it, Receive it, confess it, and walk in it. You got to know that. You got to know that. And we have been delivered from the power of darkness. And what? Not only has he delivered us from the power of darkness, he has conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. The, the, the prepositions here are pretty powerful. He says he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Imagine that this building's on fire. Imagine this whole side of the building right here is on fire, and you're in here, and you passed out, right? And I run in here, and I grab you, and I pull you out, and I pull you over here. I've delivered you from the fire. Is that enough? Why is it not enough? I got to get you out of the building. You understand? You see what he's saying here? This is, this is significant. He didn't just deliver us from the power of darkness. He conveyed us. We're in a burning house. He what? He pulled us out of the fire and did what? Put us in a house where there is no fire. That's huge. That's huge. I mean, when, when God saved you, he didn't save you a little. Matter of fact, he said, I save you to the uttermost. What's that mean? Well, you can't be any more saved. Can, can I share something with you? If you have this thinking in your head, you need to eliminate this, all right? We have this somehow foggy idea that when we get to heaven, God's going to love us more 
favor us more, accept us more, approve of us more when we finally get to heaven. Listen to me. The Father will not love you more, approve of you more, accept you more, and favor you more any more in heaven than he does right now. Why? The work is done. I cannot emphasize that enough. What, what Jesus did satisfied the Father. May not satisfy you, may not satisfy the preacher down the street, may not satisfy the evangelist down the road, but it doesn't matter. The one that matters the most is the Father, and he is satisfied with the work of his Son on your behalf. I can get, I can get fired up about that. But he delivered us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. One of the points I want to make about this too is that is the only place that I'm aware of in all of the Bible that refers to the kingdom of the Son. We've heard of the kingdom of heaven. We've heard of the kingdom of God. But in this context, he's talking about what? We have been what? Conveyed. We have been delivered out of darkness into the kingdom of his Son. The Son of what? His love. Now that's important. Let me ask you a question. How much does the Father love Jesus? Just, let's just sit and stew there a minute. Could the Father love Jesus any more than he loves him? Not possible. Not possible. And do you realize that we have been what? Placed into union with him. We're going to see this later in the letter uh, of the Colossians when he says in verse 4 of Colossians chapter 3, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Back to verse 3, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Man, 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 man. I, I'm going to say this again. I said it today at Bible study. We have the erroneous idea that God sent Jesus into the world to make bad people good. And that's not what he did. He came to raise dead people from the grave. We were dead in trespasses and sins. What we experience is resurrection. Man, if we could get that. That changes the way you live. We are living in resurrection power. The same power, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you to cause you to live a new way of living. Now, is, is, is morality a part of that? Of course it is. Is goodness a part of that? Of course it is. We're, di we're different people as a result of being delivered out of the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of his son. But you've got to understand, it goes beyond your morality. You are what? A new creation. I'm getting ahead of myself. You're a new creation. How is this even possible? How could I be delivered from the power of darkness? Verse 13. How could I be conveyed, delivered into the kingdom of the Son of his, uh, of his love? This is how, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. May I add, that's the only way. The only way to be delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed into what? The kingdom of his dear son. The only way that's possible is for you to be what? Redeemed and forgiven. What does the word redeem mean? We throw that word around a lot. What does it mean to redeem? The term was actually used in the Roman Empire at the marketplace where slaves were sold. And if you're, if you're a man who had the resources... You could go up to a slave market and you could buy that slave right there. You can do whatever you want, by the way, because the dictum of the Roman law was slaves have no rights. You could abuse her. You could not feed her. You could not clothe her. You could kill her. You know, we have Edward Gibbons talks about this in his book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. He says that, that there, there's history uh, uh, of slave owners crucifying their slaves to the mast of ships. There were three types of tools in the Roman Empire. There was dumb, semi-vocal, and vocal. Dumb referred to hammers and saws, mallets, fork, pitchforks, things of that nature. Couldn't speak. Semi-vocal semi were what? 
cows and donkeys and horses. Vocals were what? People. If you wanted to kill your donkey, who cares? You want to kill your horse? Who cares? You want to kill your slave? Who cares? That's the terminology. That's the world in which Paul is writing this. And he says, we have been redeemed. I could buy her and kill her. I could buy her and abuse her. But I could also buy her and set her free. Is that all I get is a few rights? Do you realize that's what's happened to you? God bought you. For you are not your own. You have been purchased with a price. We have, been, we have been delivered from what? The slave market of sin. And what was the price? Not silver and gold. Not things that perish, Roy. Not perishable things. But by the precious blood of God in the flesh. God came to die for you to set you free. You don't have to be in bondage. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. Go back over to John real quick. John 1, 18. I'm going to go back to verse uh, 16 as well. Actually, verse 14. I don't know why I don't read the whole chapter. <laughs> Go back to verse 14, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received. And grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then he throws something in here that just like, where did this come from? No one has seen God at any time. What? We've been talking about grace. We've been talking about fullness of God. We've been talking about the law. And what, what in the world does this have to do with anything? Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Oh, now let's go back over here to chapter 1, verse 15. If you don't get Jesus right, you don't get anything right. It matters what you believe about Jesus. You can get a lot of other things wrong in your life, but if you get, if you get him wrong... If you don't know who he is, not by religion, not by philosophy. Let me throw this out here real quick. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, follow with me, don't miss this. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, if Paul were preaching to churches in America today, he would, he would preach this. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus isn't just a good guy. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a prophet. Here, uh, it wasn't too many uh, years ago after 9-11, uh, a lot of uh, Muslims began to put billboards. I don't even know if you've ever seen one or not. The billboards in major cities in the United States, Albuquerque, Dallas, Austin, Memphis, Knoxville, Chicago. They put up these huge billboards all across the country and it said, we believe in Jesus too. Not according to scripture you don't. You don't believe he's God. You believe he was a prophet. You believe he was just another man. Maybe a good man, but just a man. But what's he warn us about? Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, in who? Jesus Christ. In him dwells how much of the fullness of God? All 
the fullness of God. This is a, this is a mystery that should cause us to worship. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. I want to show you some things here in this passage, and I don't know what translation you have, so it may read a, a little differently. But I, I want to take verses 15 through 20, and I want to show you something before we break into this. It's real important. Um, does anybody know when I use the term... Uh, chiastic structure Hebrew has it but also the Greek language in, what the, in which the New Testament was written is there was a structure of words in writing paragraphs if you will they didn't have paragraphs like we have them but in sentence structures that, that sometimes the order of things fell this way and then from the bottom it was reversed to make a point all right you find that in this passage. I really want you to take the time to see the beauty of this passage and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what, what is being taught here, okay? For example, uh, and I'm, I'm coming out of the New King James Version and yours may read differently. Um, notice in verse 15, it begins with, he is, well, well, how's yours begin? How's verse 15 begin? Who is? Christ is, who is, he is. Okay, notice that in, in verse 15. Uh, go down to verse uh, 18. What's it say? My translation says, and he is. And what's your say? He is. Okay, he is. Christ is. Who is. It's real important to follow what Paul's doing here. This is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. Because what we're going to see, and we're going to break this down, and I'm running out of time, but, but, but we're, we're going we're to break this down. What Paul starts off by saying is that Jesus Christ, he is. And then he says, he is. And what you're going to see in that first section of Scripture is, what he's going to say is, he is God in the flesh, and as a result, he is the, what, head of the old creation. Let me make it, make, let me simplify that. He is the creator. Jesus is the creator. I'm not saying he did it apart from the Father, and I'm not saying he didn't do it without the Holy Spirit. But John says in John chapter 1 that, that, that he is what? All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the creator of everything in the universe. He is the head. Not just the creator, he is the head of creation. He is the head of everything that exists. Everything. When you see the term, by the way, that he is the firstborn over all creation, some would have us believe that he is the first created. That's not what he's saying. The firstborn talks about what his preeminence, his rank above all things. Let me illustrate that. Do you remember uh, in the story of Esau and Jacob? What was, the, what was the tragic outcome of the relationship between Esau and Jacob? Who was the firstborn? What did it mean to be the firstborn? He got the blessings. He was what? In rank of the children born to Isaac and Rebekah, and there were what? Two sons. Who had the preeminence? Esau. He was the firstborn. What, what, what Paul is telling us here when he uses the term firstborn is that what? Jesus is number one above all things. Why? Because he made all things. Jesus can't be created if he created all things. If nothing existed before he created, then he's not created. He is the creator. And he's the creator of what? All things that have been created. But what's the problem in the, this created world in which we live? And by the way, I, keep, I tell you this all the time. That's the damnation of evolution. 
We talked about that today in our ladies' Bible study. Everybody wants to know what's wrong with America. What's wrong with America is we stopped teaching kids that God is the creator. We started telling them that they had no significance. They had no value. They just happened to appear out of nowhere, and their ancestry is from what? Monkeys. And made a monkey out of us. And now what? Now we have, I mean, we were, had some lady in our, in our class today that's going through some education training in the public school system here in Texas. We thought it was bad enough that boys are identifying as girls and girls are identifying as boys. She sat through a conference for counselors where in, they're, they're, they're talking about uh, that some kids want to identify, and they're already doing it in the state of Arkansas. There was a school district up in Arkansas, Clinton, Arkansas, where the, the students come in and they want to identify as a dog or a cat. And, and, and they, no, it's serious. And, and they're allowing them to bring a litter box to class. <laughs> it's happening in Texas, too. I'm telling you, I, I know it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be ugly. It's not funny. It's not cute. It is abominable. This ought to be highly offensive to us that we have allowed a degenerate, ungodly society to drag our children into the mire of that foolishness. And I, I told the ladies in there, if you have a kid that's in a school district in this town and that issue comes up, let me know I'll be at the first school board meeting. It is time to draw the line. We are created in the image of God, not a dog, not a cat. We need to know our gender and our roles. Absolutely. And we, have, we, we gave up. And we thought a little compromise would be okay. And, and the devil just rocked the church in America to sleep. And we just woke up a couple years ago and we want to know what's happened. It's serious, and, and, and I'm serious about it because I got grandkids. It, 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 on one hand, it makes me angry, and on the other hand, it breaks my heart. What hope do our grandchildren have? For Christ's sake, what hope do they have when, when we are more worried about offending what a 14-year-old thinks he or she identifies as. God help us stand up and teach them who they are. I, I'm afraid, yes. You know, I, I, Shannon and I have talked about that. I don't want my great-grandchildren, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren to look back and want to know where Pops was. Where was Pops when all this was happening? Christ is the creator of all things. He has created everything for a purpose. You've heard me say this before. Whether it's a star or a starfish, it's got a purpose. If it's a man, it's got a purpose. If it's a woman, it's a purpose. If it's a dog, it's a purpose. If it's a cow, it's a purpose. Everything in the created order has order, design, and purpose. He designed it that way. Now, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to let you out at 8.15. Uh, in this first section, Paul says, let there be no confusion. Christ is the creator of all things. Nothing exists. And by the way, can I go ahead and tell you this? There's nothing outside the, the realm of his authority. There is not a virus outside of his authority. There is not a tornado outside of his authority. There is not a hurricane outside of his authority. There is not a dog outside of his authority. There is not a gray whale outside of his authority. From the tallest mountain, Mount Everest, 29,000 feet, to the deepest trenches of the Pacific Ocean, about 39,000 feet, and everything in between, and everything beyond this planet, and going out into galaxies and universe, you know, the universe that we know nothing about, that far extends it, he is the one who rules over all of it. He is not weak, he is not limited, he is not handicapped by any of it.
That's important for us to understand. That'll change your worship. That'll change the way you pray. That is, that'll change the way you believe. That'll change the way you act. That'll change the way you, you behave your life. Because the same one that did that in the second session here is not only, he's not only the creator of the created order that rebelled against him, he's also the one who has reconciled it and is now simultaneously making a new creation. You're in your part of the new creation. Now, not in heaven, not in the millennial kingdom, not when everything gets right. Right now, in this world, you are members of the body of Christ. You are one with him. He is the head and we are the body. In this world, full of mess and disguise and deceit and confusion, we are the body of Christ in this world. And, and as a result, we ought to go out and, and live that way. Because we have the message that the world needs. These confused teenagers. We have the message. You know, you want to know why the government wants to put your kids into Head Start in school as early and as often as they can? Propaganda. They want them as early as they can get them. Want them as long as they can get them. Why? To fill their heads full of foolishness. And I'll get on this and I'll just be glad to get on to it. And you got to beg parents to come to church and bring their kids to children's church. And everything else in the world is more important. God help us. Everything is more important than making sure your kids know who Christ is. And not only that, you don't even crack the Bible at home. Forget the fact we don't bring them to church. It's not important to you. When's the last time you, you sat down with your kids and you, sir, taught them the word of God. Not me. I'm here to help you. I'm here to equip you. I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to correct you. I'm here to rebuke you. I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to comfort you. I'm here to kick you in the behind. But you, sir, do you not understand what's happening? Is your head in the sand? We went to go see Barrett on his fourth birthday and we weren't there but a couple of hours, and Joshua was just livid. And I said, what are you upset about? He said, I've been meaning to tell you this. He said, this is a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago. We took Barrett over to the theater to see Buzz Lightyear, a Disney production. Buzz Lightyear. And the supervisor of uh, Buzz Lightyear was a woman, and she was, uh, uh, let me be careful. I have children in here, was had an affinity for women and kissed a woman in the cartoon. And Barrett turned and looked at his dad and said, why did she do that at four? You say, well, he didn't understand. Desensitize, desensitize. Do it enough and it doesn't matter. And then we'll get him in school and what? We'll teach them some more. We'll teach them some more. And if you're a teacher and you're a Christian, we'll threaten your job if you say something about it because you're not compassionate. It's, it's not going to be easy because we let it get away. But it wasn't easy in the first century either. But it begins at home, and it begins with dad. Saying this is important. Important. I, and we're going to get into this. We didn't get very far at all into this. Uh, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to let you go right here. I've got two minutes here. In verse 15, he says, 
he is or who is or Christ is. And then in verse uh, 18, he says, and he is or Christ is or who is the head of the body. What, what Paul is doing right here is he's saying Jesus is what? He is the creator of everything that exists, visible and invisible. And he is the ruler over all of it. And then he reminds them that he is also the head over the new creation because he is reconciling things to himself. You realize we have the ministry of reconciliation. God has reconciled to himself through Christ. And what are we? We're examples of that. Flawed as we may be, weak as we may be, we are examples of the reconciliation. We are examples of the power of resurrection. Verses uh, 17 and 18. Uh, verse 17, and he is. He is before all things. In him all things consist. What Paul's doing right there is he's tying it all together. Uh, I, I want to say this too because Shannon and I have talked an awful lot about it. She, she's told me, she said, you know, years ago, she said going to church was very confusing to me because it almost sounded like God wasn't really sure what was going on and that he was just kind of grasping at straws at different times. You know, kind of had a plan A and that didn't work out real well, so he had a plan B and well, that didn't work out real well. And then he had a plan C. And I mean, you know, we, I mean, plan A was Adam and Eve, and they messed up. And, you know, poor God didn't know that was going to happen. And so then he, you know, then, then, you know, he finds a pretty good guy named Noah, you know, and destroys everything. That's plan B and starts over with them. And then, gosh, that didn't work out too well. So now he's got a plan C. He's got Abraham. And, well, that didn't work out too well. And we go from plan A to plan B to plan C to plan D. And, you know, God's, you guys trying to get this thing in order. I want you to be well established in this. God has one plan. It's plan A. And he's working plan A. He's on time. Everything is working out according to his sovereign plan. God's not out of control. He's not fretting. He's not worried. He's not like some government leaders who have dementia. And the Bible gives us clear evidence that God's working a plan. He's working a plan. He's working a plan. That God sent forth his son, what? In the fullness of times. God's on schedule. Things are working. We just need to get in, we just need to get in the plan. And it starts with what? If you know the son, Jesus, you know his will. And then what do you do? You don't ask God to bless your will. You line up your will with his. That's the problem in the church today. The problem in church today is we want our will and we ask God to bless it. God's not obligated to bless my will. And I can assure you he won't. And he will let me exercise my will to do what I want to do without blessing it. And I can create all the mess in the world and he's not obligated to bless it. Repentance is about what? Not me talking God into blessing my mess, but into what? Getting under his authority. That's repentance. Man, man, man. I didn't know where that was going tonight, and it just went all over the place. Listen, you got to read and pray and meditate and ask God to give you spiritual understanding, knowledge, and wisdom over these verses, 15 through 20. I'm going to tell you how important it is to really get more and more understanding and spiritual insight into what he's saying in verses 15 through 20. Listen to me. will change our lives. It will radically change change our lives we will stop living for things that are passing away we'll stop worrying and fretting about things that are outside of our control we will just humble ourselves under the mighty hand of god and we will fulfill god's purposes for our life and when it's all said and done and we all say amen and we get to heaven he will be pleased and glorified 
That is the business. I'm not here for me, nor are you. We were not redeemed, to quote Joel Osteen. We weren't redeemed for our best life now. God didn't save me so I could have my best life now. God saved me so I could what? Serve him. And by the way, why do you want the best life now? I want my best life there. Not here. Why? Because Jesus said it's where robbers steal and where rust what? Corrupts? Moss eat? Wait, why do you want to try to build treasure here? <laughs> I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight. God bless you, and we'll see you next, well, we'll see you Sunday, Lord willing. All right. Oh, I also want to commend you, too. We have almost 60 people signed up for our evangelism training. I commend you for that. I commend you for that. All right. Well, God bless you. Have a great, uh, great rest of your week. Shannon, I got a meeting with Roy real quick, and we'll... We'll get out of here. All right? Good deal. Good to see you guys.